Okay, very excited to be joined back here with uh, independent candidate for governor, Bill Walker, and his running mate, Heidi Dragas. How are you guys doing? We're doing Great. well. Great. Good. Thanks for having us. You were here just, just under a year ago when you filed to right, run. Right, right. And, and with this new system, we talked about that before, now you pick your running mate opposed to before with the kind of separate primaries, and then you get married up afterwards. Um, in your case, before with Malat, you guys joined up before, so you kind of had that. Right. Um, but in, for most people in the Democratic or Republican side, they... They um, wait till after the primary. So I guess the first question is, what, what's it been like the last year campaigning? You've been all over the state. There's, there's yeah. What's it been like? <laughs> <It's> been, <laughs> I'll ask both of you. But there's there's ten it, candidates. It's been there's, quite a year. There's ten <laughs> ten tickets in this race. Yeah, so there's, yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's, well, you really realize uh, what a huge state it is when you run for statewide office and go from one end to the other and back and forth. And yeah, well, I mean, we really have we've really had a. Um, a great time traveling and meeting tons of people, and uh, so it's been it's been a busy year. Now you've you've run before in twenty eight and twenty fourteen mm-hmm. and twenty ten. Yep. I did. This is your first time running for it's my first rodeo. You, you went for the big one statewide. Yeah. I just not, jumped not, right over. Not state house <laughs> no, or assembly. Just went... So what's it been like the last year? It's been really exciting. It's been a lot of fun. You know, I was born and raised in Alaska, but there's a lot of places in Alaska that I had never been to before. Um, you know, it's expensive and um, some of these places are remote. So I got to Kodiak for the first time. Boy, we had a great trip in Kodiak. Um, I went to Petersburg for Little Norway. Um, Petersburg knows oh, heard, how to I have fun. I heard about that. That, that sounded, that sounded it fun. Was, oh, I, felt, I actually felt bad. I told the campaign, I feel bad. This feels like a vacation. I brought my husband, Kevin, and my daughter, Olive, and... I mean, we were, and my husband's family is Norwegian, and so we, that was a fantastic trip. It was just really beautiful, good people. That's been, I think, the 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 most delightful part about this campaign is getting to see all these different places in Alaska and meeting the, the folks that live there. And they're, you know, everybody that we meet is so passionate about their communities and their unique um, sort of identity uh, as Alaskans. And so that has by far been the best part about campaigning. Uh, I want to ask about the, the, the dividend this year. It, it kind of got higher than a lot of people expected because of the price of oil shot up in, in March after, after the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it's going to come out a little early in September. And, you know, last year it was 1100. Never ever since 2016, when there was the veto, it's been a big fight with the legislature. Mm-hmm. Where, where, where do you see this? Do you see this issue getting resolved. I mean, there's this 50 50 concept. A lot of people, the governor and the legislature kind of settled on. And then that, as soon as the price of oil went up, it was like, oh, we can do a lot more than that. Right. You know, I think with the, the leadership from the legislature on, on doing the energy rebate, I thought was, uh, was wise. We certainly supported that. We appreciate that. That's been done before by uh, uh, actually Governor Palin. I did that in 2008 when oil went to 147. Oh. So, so that's not that was good that the legislature did that. So, you know, as long as the, the dividend is sustainable, we're not overdrawing. It is, is is a big concern, and but we need to make it more predictable. We need to take it, resolve it in such a way that it's not the political football taking up an inordinate amount of time in the legislative session because a lot of good laws don't get passed. A lot of bad laws do get passed because they're, they're juggling about the, the dividend. It's always sort of the, the, the leverage point on so many different things when not. So that's what we would do. The very first thing we would do is sit down with the legislators, sit down with Alaska, similar to what we did before when we had a $4 billion hole in our budget uh, and, 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 work, and come to a resolution uh, for, so that can be resolved once and for all and, and move on, not just resolved under one administration or the next administration. We need to resolve that for the for the end of the future. So Alaskans can pre- uh, depend upon that and, and, and know what they can expect. Well, when you came in in 2014, the prices started to go down and then and then not long after it really went down. And you're basically whole time as governor. The price of oil was, you know, 50s, 60s. It never really got high. And it's been you saw with COVID, it went down to below zero. But now it's an election year and, right. you know, it's gone up to, you know, 100, 130, 100, you know, it's in the 110s right now. Mm-hmm. It, it, um, it's it's interesting how when the price goes up, how things, the conversations change it does. so crazy <clears throat> rapidly in the legislature. Well, you know, at $26 oil, uh, oil companies can lay down a drill rig. Um, I can't lay down education, public safety, you know, the, the, the you know, services people depend upon. So that's why we, we you know, by, by making the adjustment we did on the dividend, uh, we're enabled enabled us with the legislature to pass the, the Permanent Fund Protection Act 
which is Senate Bill 26 for a structured draw. So it was a precursor to that to get, uh, we went from 90% dependent on oil down to 30% because 70% of our revenues now come from earnings of the, of the permanent fund. So we're almost there. We just need to go up to $100 billion. Um, so I want to ask about the, the legislature. It's, it's, there's going to be at least 20, I think 25. It could be up to, if some races go a certain way, it could be up to 30 new legislators out of 60. Um, how do you, you know, you were confirmed by the legislature when you were appointed commissioner. I know you worked with the legislature when you were commissioner. Uh, if, if you prevail, what's it going to be like working with a whole bunch of, some old people are going to come back, but it's going to be a lot of new people who, who've never really been in Juneau at all. So what's that going to be like? I mean, I think it's going to be challenging. Um, it's always good to get new perspectives in Juneau, um, but there is something to be said for having or maintaining some institutional knowledge in Juneau. I do think that the last few years, as we've seen quite a bit of turnover, um, how difficult it is to to get things done when there isn't that continuity of um, of of how things work, um, you know, for the betterment of of the body as a whole. Um, there's just you know, it's it was interesting to watch the the caucus of equals and you know, some of, <laughs> it's it's caucus it's tough to get things done when you have a caucus of equals and. So I think that it will be challenging, but you know, for, for Bill and I, we have always sort of prided ourselves on being able to work with anyone. Um, I think that was something that, that both of us really excelled in when we were, um, when we were in office is um, developing relationships with legislators um, from both parties um, or an independence. I mean, that is the beauty of running as independents, that we are not beholden to any party. We are beholden only to Alaska. And I think it starts with developing relationships cool. with those legislators and, and, and really leading in stark contrast to the current administration, who, you know, someone had said the phrase followship, and it feels like that right now, that there's a lot of followship that... Um, well, let's see what the legislature comes up with. And, you know, it, it, the role of a governor is to lead um, and to set an example and to set the policy and set the tone and then follow through with that by meeting with legislators um, to find common ground. Um, and we're pretty eager to get started on that, I think, on day one. You know, I mean, you had your challenges with the legislature. You had, you had some wins, too. You mentioned the SB 26. Mm -hmm. but, but just this kind of environment where so many legislators are not running for re-election. There's been some redistricting issues as well, but a lot of people are just, it's so toxic down there. You pay attention. Um, I guess, what are your thoughts about this this new legislature with a lot of new people? Well, new, with new people comes new ideas. And so I'm, I kind of look at the, my glasses half full kind of approach to, to new folks coming in the legislature. So we'll see, we'll see who is there. But we know I like not just about us being independents, we're really a unity ticket. I mean, kind of like we had before, uh, you know, so I mean, Heidi is more to the left, not just on this couch, but I'm more to the left and I'm, I'm more to the right. And, and so we, we are actually a unity ticket. And I, I like it that way because, um, you know, we bring, we invite all, all, you know, sides of an issue, if you will, in, into the discussion in, at the table, uh, not just, you know, this is where we are and, and either with us or against us, whatnot. So I like, I really like the unity uh, ticket concept. Now, a year ago, I asked you about the gas line and we kind of discussed that you've been long time What's your license plate? AK LNG or it is AK LNG. It's been there a long time. So a year ago it was it was really there, there was no optimistic outlook. Fast forward now we have this situation in, in Ukraine. There's a gas supply issue in Europe. Uh, the price of gas is up. There's the governor was out in Asia um, recently. There's been a lot of talk about you know gas security. Is 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 there a, a bigger chance now? Uh, you were got pretty close with there was this China um, deal. Is there a potential for a gas line? You know, I, I think there is, I, but we have to do, it's, it's all about one thing. It's all about the market. I don't care how many permits you have, how many this or that requires two things, the gas and the market. So when we left, we had 15 uh, LOIs, letters of intent, non-binding, you know, with the largest buyers in Asia, with Tokyo Gas, Tokyo Electric, Co-Gas, Korea Gas, you know, some China companies. So, so we had 15 of them and they all were allowed to expire and they all went someplace else. They went to Louisiana, they went to, Port Arthur, Texas, so they, want, they found their supply someplace else. They were pretty surprised about it, that they didn't get phone calls returned. It just stopped when he, when he left. Well, office, this happens, so. I mean, when Murkowski, he had a, he had a plan, Palin had a plan, a GF Parnell had a, I mean, everybody has a plan, and then 
Well, you the, know, the, difference the, governor, was, the difference was we had customers. I mean, if you don't know, know customers, no project. And so, so that was what unique about what we did. We spent time in the market with, you know, the, the prime minister of Japan, you know, with the president of Korea. Uh, president of Vietnam and, and President of China. So we did, we met with, uh, and you know, President Trump was a, a huge part of us, uh, our involvement with uh, with that, because he, he basically sent, sent the, you know, the delegation of, from China, you know, to Alaska to, to meet with us and whatnot, so. I, I understand, I think the market, that's that's an important part of it, but why, why hasn't the state ever built the thing to Fairbanks, where there's some costs there, but if you look at this inversion problem with the, the smoke and the wood burning sure. stuff, I mean, the cost of energy was, was way, way cheaper with natural gas. Why hasn't the state ever built that? Because when it's the Fairbanks, you're getting you know, about a third of the way there. Sure. And it makes it, makes it it's cheaper. About, yeah, it's about a little bit. Yeah, you're right about that. You know, part of the problem is population. You know, that's the whole part of the whole issue about the export piece of it is that we're just, you know, that small population with a very expensive a piece of infrastructure. So we need the export piece of it to make it to make it work. It drives me crazy from... Uh, when I'm in Fairbanks, I talk about Fairbanks being 400 miles from Energy Mecca, and they have high cost energy. Their air quality is an issue, uh, so it's it's a, it's a big issue that uh, needs to be resolved and, and can be resolved. But just a, a line, just a, a big line, just to Fairbanks is going to be is going to be tough. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask about the uh, the the election. Uh, we're coming up in this. We have this new system now. This open primary ranked choice. If if you prevail, Heidi, you'll be you'll be in charge of elections. There's been nationally a lot of talk from Trump and other people. There's been people don't really, a lot of people don't believe in the election system. What do you think about our election system? There were some bills in the legislature, several bills this last session. Some people were talking about all kinds of things. I mean, is it secure? Can it, can it be improved? You know, where, where are we right now in Alaska with our election system? I think Alaska has a, a really solid group of professionals running the division of elections. Um, and I think that we have uh, one of the most secure elections uh, in the country. Um, I know that that is something that the Division of Elections has been looking at to ensure that we have safe and secure elections. Um, and also that they are, you know, we have open and fair elections so that people have access to the ballot box. That's sort of, that's equally an issue. Um, we've had problems in rural Alaska ensuring that folks have access uh, to the ballot box with um, limited staffing um, and locations. So, I, I mean, I think that I would I would leave those decisions to the professionals at the Division of Elections. Um, but I think, you know, cybersecurity threats are here and they are prevalent. I remember when we left office, I mean, there were definitely concerns um, that we were briefed on um, at the cabinet level. Those are increasing in frequency. Um, and severity. And that is something I'm really pleased to hear that the Division of Elections works with um, the Homeland Security um, Office, the it, Washington, D.C., um, with the with federal Homeland Security to make sure that our elections are safe and secure. And there's an exchange of information there. So we make sure that our, you know, that that our vote is protected. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to continue to be an issue in this country. Um, but I feel really confident about elections in Alaska. Bill, do, do you worry? I mean, we live in a democracy and if a lot of people don't trust the elections, that's a, a problem. And there's been so much and it's hard to really know what to believe. And there's so much talk on, on either side of it. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess overall, generally, what, what do you think about this kind of lately, this kind of questioning of elections? <clears throat> well, really I mean, I think, a... I think election, it, it's good to ask questions. It's good to sort of, you know, you know, push points on the system to make sure it is. I, I'm. I recall that um, Lieutenant Governor uh, Kevin Myers put out a, a report um, after the last election, basically confirming exactly what uh, uh, Commissioner Dragas just said about about the uh, that we have a good system. Can are there areas of improvement? If there are, we absolutely will do it. No, there's no question about it. But um, I, I think we're in I think we're in a good space in that regard. So in this new open primary, there, like I said, there's ten tickets. There's three Republican tickets. There's some independent tickets. You guys are kind of the main independent ticket. Dunleavy is the main Republican ticket, and then you have Lescara and his running mate Jessica Cook is is the Democratic ticket. Um, I think most people understand it's going to be you three, and then there'll be a fight between Kirk and Pierce. I think and Kirk and Pierce for the fifth spot. But in this open system, it seems like you you're probably overlapping a little bit with the Guerra voters, and it's it's you know it's a whole new system. So I guess what's been kind of the strategy of of the primary, and then going forward to the the ranked choice element of it. You know, if you uh, look at our, our co-chairs, they're uh, uh, 
we have a lot of Republicans as co-chairs. Uh, we have folks that have served in the legislature, as uh, Senator Gary Wilkins as an example. Kathy Giesel. Uh, Kathy Giesel. Mm -hmm. We have, um, uh, so we have a, you know, we have a lot of folks on on the on, you know, on the right and a lot of folks on the left. So our our path, you know, does it it, it crossed over into Dunleavy's? Uh, you would think would be voting for Dunleavy, and who would be voting for for Guerra or whatnot? So so we're down that, that down that uh, that middle lane as as a unity ticket that we're we're pretty comfortable with that. Has has it been Heidi kind of? Hard or has it been? How's it been navigating this primary where there's so many different people in the same primary as before, where it was very you know party driven? You know, I don't think that part of it's been hard at all. I mean, you know, there's <clears throat> Bill and I see eye to eye on on most issues, not all issues, um, and the ones that we don't, we sort of work through and talk talk about and come to an understanding and. You know, Bill and I have worked together for many years, so we have a really comfortable relationship. And we, we, you know, when you t when you have the ability, when you have that sort of relationship built in after all these years, you have the ability to sort of work through and discuss and reach out to others, um, you know, who have different perspectives. Um, so I, I don't know. I, 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 I think that part of it, when it's sort of liberating when you don't have to run on a party platform. We just get, I mean, we are, our, you know, our, our central focus is on what's best for Alaska, what makes sense for Alaska. And when you do that, I mean, I think it's sort of, it, I think there's a reason why we have so much uh, uh, support from Republicans and Democrats and, you know, independent moderates that are right in the middle that are just sort of looking for common sense to return to Alaska again. And we haven't found the debate stage all that crowded at this point. Yeah. And, and so, <laughs> right, well, you know, it's, I think it's, it's, it's so. with the new primary, it's, I was actually talking to somebody yesterday about how before there was party primaries, in, in a lot of cases, those, those were really, really the deciding factor for a lot of mm -hmm. legislative yep. races. Yeah. Now there's not. So it's actually affected me a little bit because there's really, really not a big push to advertise or mm. have any, any real campaigning until after the primary now with this ranked choice um, you know, general. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think hopefully, I mean, we're planning on hosting a debate and there's going to be a lot of activity after the primary, but with this open primary, there's, like I said, with, with your race, it's pretty clear who's going to be the top three and it's kind of the fight for fourth. Um, where was I going to, where was I going to go? Oh, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the state of Alaska recently, they came out with, a uh, some coverage on, on there's like a quarter of the positions are unfilled and we see this mm -hmm. not, not just in the state and in, in public sector, but the private sector, it's been really hard for, for white collar, blue collar to find people. There's a sh shortage nationwide. Heidi, you were the commissioner of, of labor. Um, I, I guess how much of a concern is it that, that there's so many openings in the state, um, in the state for jobs, and then also in the private sector for yep. finding people to, to, to work? It is a huge concern. I mean, we could take up the rest of this show talking about this. And I think there's a lot of reasons for it. I mean, right now, um, people are finding that there are better opportunities in the private sector, but there are also better opportunities by leaving Alaska. And that is worrisome. I mean, when my dad came up to Alaska in 1970, I mean, we had good paying jobs and benefits um, that could support a family. And now you see, you know, state employment, um, you know, the same job uh, compared to the private sector. Folks are paid far less. Um, the tier four defined contribution benefit system has really crippled a lot of agencies in recruitment and retention. There isn't that sort of that hook to keep people here, um, you know, with a, with a good um, defined benefit retirement system. Um, and it would be great to return to a cost neutral um, defined well, the, benefit the, retirement system. The, there, there was a, there's been bills for years on, yeah. on the defined pension, the defined contribution or defined benefit just for the, 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 you know, uh, public safety for the yeah. police and fire. And, and even Commissioner Dunleavy's Commissioner Cockrell at, a, at his confirmation hearing said that we're, we're, a re we're a recruiting ground for other Western states where they come here, get the training, do the five years, they leave. Right. <clears throat> and it, this, it's really, like she mentioned, retaining people yeah. and, and getting people to, to work here long, you know, long term. Well, and the problem, the other problem is, is that you, when you lose someone like, like troopers, we were losing troopers to the King County. Uh, because mm -hmm. they had a retirement system, so we gave them a a uh, a fifteen percent raise uh, in I think in around September of uh, of twenty eighteen, and put another raise in the budget, another fifteen percent in the budget. Governor Dunleavy took that out of the budget, but the problem is that when you when you lose someone like a trooper, for example, 
there's a lot of money invested in getting them, you know, uh, trained and up to speed and, and whatnot. So it's not just like, you know, bringing another trooper. It doesn't work that way. And so, so it's, uh, retention is a, is a huge issue. There's no question about that. We are, you know, I just, uh, we have over uh, a shortage of 1,100 uh, teachers that were short in Alaska. I mean, that's just, that just unprecedented. So, you know, so the good news, we have a university system, uh, a great university system. Uh, you know, the last thing we need to do is be, you know, cutting and, and diminishing our university system. We need to be growing the university system because that we need to grow our own. We, we, we used to, you know, I'd say back in the day that the tier one, I think we could probably agree, it was maybe a little bit too, too generous. But now it's gone to this tier four where it's really bad. And it seems like every year this comes, for many years this comes up and they... Legislature can't seem to figure it out. Um, if we don't get this resolved, what's 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 it going to look like in, in five or ten years in, in the state? Well, I think that this year it got further than it has in many years, and I think it's because you know, regardless of party, people are uh, the legislators are starting to realize that we have a we have a crisis on our hands in Alaska, and and this is the the difficulty in recruiting recruiting and retaining state employees is a symptom of a larger problem in Alaska. And it is one of the central reasons why Bill and I are running. Because we want an Alaska where people want to live and work and stay in their communities and uh, uh, be, feel good about the education system that their kids are in, um, that we have affordable housing in this state, that we have affordable childcare so that people can go to work and make sure that their, their children are in a, a safe and supportive place that they can afford um, to put in child care, that we have a university system that we are investing in. And that's why it's it's been so frustrating over the last three and a half years, almost four years now, to see this governor just chipping away at these institutions, these pillars of what makes Alaska so great and so special. And it's I think it should scare all Alaskans, maybe scare is not the right word, but it should really concern all Alaskans, especially the business community, that we have this mass exodus of working age individuals leaving because they see better opportunities outside. It used to be the opposite. And if we want our communities to thrive, if we want small businesses, if we want new industries in Alaska, we have to invest in ourselves. We, it, we have got to take the opposite approach to, to the way this governor uh, leads or doesn't lead. Um, I want to ask about uh, fundraising. You, your campaign is on the top. It's about a million and a half. You, you have gotten some large donations, some six-figure donations. The governor got some large ones as well, um, big one from his brother. Uh, because of this issue in the legislature, they had a campaign limits bill. They almost got over the limit. I was in the room. It was in the Senate. It was 1130, 30 minutes before the session ended, and they couldn't get it over. Um, I, I guess, what, what are your thoughts on this unlimited con contributions? Are, are you for that, or, or do you think there should be limits on, on per, you know, individual to candidate contributions? Yeah, I think there needs to be limits. I think there has to be. Um, I, just, I just think it makes a, dis it makes a disproportion for those that can, can give large donations to, to, uh, to have influence potentially. I guess, you know, the reason we are raising like as we are is because of the $3 million that uh, Governor Dunleavy brought in of uh, money 36 hours before the law changed. From the Republican so, Governor so, Association. The yes, PAC and so we don't know, he met with them, of course, and so we don't know um, who, who donated that, who, who put into that $3 million. Everybody knows exactly, every penny we, that we collected um, and in fact, we've got some envelopes here, Jeff, for you. While we're, while we're here. Anyway, uh, well, everybody knows that what uh, knows who it came from, except for that three million dollars, and, and it's referred to as dark money. And it, what it is is that someone can can donate into that. You know, the Republican Governors Association was just the, the 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 collector of the money, and then they came from them. It wasn't from them as a as an entity. Right. Uh, and so anybody that you know, somebody asked the other day, well, how much money did the did the uh, the billionaire whose daughter was appointed to the the permanent fund, uh, how much money went into, you know, with that $3 million? We will never know that. Ellie, Ellie Rub Rubenstein. Yeah. And, you know, our governor was earlier, and I asked, I asked about that, and I think that surprised a lot of people. I mean, a daughter of Dave Rubenstein, daughter of Alice Rogoff, who I don't, I don't think was ever really friendly with the Republicans, and somehow she's all of a sudden appointed to the permanent, which I, that's a good question I could ask. Do you think the permanent fund trustees should be confirmed by the legislature? Because they, they're not right now. And Absolutely. This, this has really created some tension lately with this um, Angela Rodell situation, and you know, a few of them are commissioners on, I think it's natural resources and, and revenue. 
but the, the main other members aren't confirmed by the legislature. Right. You know, I did actually, we did an op-ed for the, uh, it was in the news bar, I think, um, a month or so ago on the on that issue that, you know, now the permanent fund, it generates 70% of our revenue. You know, we need to treat it differently than just like an investment fund. I mean, it is a source, a serious source of revenue. So the method should be similar to the way we select judges. Or there's a, a vetting process on the names that come through. And, and, and of course, the, the, there is no legislative uh, oversight on the selection of judges, but there needs to be some check and balance on that. And, and myself, I mean, I, as, as governor, I, you know, I, I made appointments and I, you know, I, and I certainly uh, would support a different process for selection because I think it's, it has the tendency of, of uh, political mischief and, and we don't, we need to remove all that. I, I want to ask you the, the topic of earmarks has, has been, been back lately. They were banned for many, I think 10 years or more, and now they're calling congressionally directed spending. And Senator Murkowski has just recently announced half a billion there's been some some from before, some other ones which are going for infrastructure and different projects. Um, Senator Sullivan hasn't done any of those yet. I guess what what are your what are your thoughts on this return of kind of earmarks and how that you know money comes to Alaska and if that's something that we should be. Well, the one that we're focused on largely is the is the bipartisan infrastructure uh, funding that's going to be available. And what excites us about that is that there's a, you know there's four or five billion that's sort of designated for Alaska, and that's wonderful. But there's another 100 to 300 billion dollars in there that's available for competitive grants for different states. And some of it is, is a matching grant, 80, 20, 90, 10, so it's an out and out grant. That's potentially transformational for Alaska. That's, a, that's a, to us, that's equivalent to uh, what the Alkan Highway did with the trans Alaska oil pipeline. So here's this opportunity and it's based upon need. It's based upon, you know, who, who needs, who's, who's behind on infrastructure, who's behind on maintenance, who's behind on broadband, who's behind on coastal infrastructure. If we can't out need out rural every other state in the nation, there's something wrong with us. So we will aggressively, aggressively go after that. And I was very disappointed when Governor Dunleavy made no reference to that in the state of the state. No thank you to late Congressman Don Young for his yeoman's work in the House. It would not have gotten through without Congressman Young's efforts. Uh, Senator Mikowski and, and, and Senator Sullivan, my goodness, they've done their part. Now we have to aggressively go after that. There's a lot of tribal funds available for there. So I look at that as, as something that um, someone's going to get that money. Some states are going to divide up amongst states. Some states, and it's not going to be based upon, I suggest it be based upon area, uh, square footage. Uh, well, because be we, nice. we have such, I, I tell people, we have such a low population that, you know, we had Ted Stevens for a long time, and we have now Lisa Murkowski's been there for a long time, but but without some force like that, most people in D.C. don't care about it. It's 700,000 people. It doesn't really, but it's the, three the electoral nice, votes. It's not a big. But the nice thing about it, this doesn't have to go to a vote. This is already gone. This is, this is there available. So it's just based upon, based upon your application. You know, we need grant writers. We need a thousand grant writers in Alaska because we need to go after this money as aggressively as we can, because once it's gone, it's gone. So, I mean, we've talked about different projects, you know, you know, renewable energy, you know, hydro projects, you know, roads and bridges and all sorts of access across our state. Our railroads should be it should be a spider web across the state to access to our uh -huh. resources. And this is the opportunity to do it. So, you know, so when he doesn't talk about it. That, we don't stop talking about it because that's that's an exciting opportunity. And, that, and maybe it's just because, you know, born in the territory of Alaska, I saw a struggle with, with uh, uh, you know, growing our state and, and how every, you know, most of the highways we have are because of the military. Richardson Highway is, you know, General Richardson. And, and so so it's... Al can too, World War II. Exactly, exactly. So <clears throat> One that's, of the things I would add on this too is that, you know, when we, when we came into the office, it came into office and we had $26 a barrel oil we were, we had to cut, we had to cut. It was painful and it was necessary because we had a huge $4.4 .4 billion deficit. And so over the course of the first two years of our administration, I, I was, I served as commissioner of labor and workforce development. Our department was cut 37 or 38%, it's a huge cut. And, you know, the governor sort of gave us a directive, said go after every single federal dollar that you can to try to supplement what we've, we have lost. And so at our department, you know, I directed my staff, I said, let's go after every single federal grant that we can qualify for. These are competitive grants that, you know, different states, different agencies, nonprofits can go after. And over the course of four years, I think we, I, I haven't added it up, it's roughly $20 million in competitive federal grant funds that we went after. And that was because we took action um, and it was work and it was effort and you have to keep up with those. And there's a lot of auditing and accounting with it, but that, for the most part, replaced a lot of the workforce development yeah. training funds that were cut, 
through the first two years of our administration because there was so little general fund money to to cut it that those were the pots of money that oh, we, we, did. we saw with this with this arpa money there, there was even in the governor's budget they used i think you know half a billion for revenue replacement and the price of oil went up and that wasn't as as needed but i mean it, mm-hmm. the federal we all know the federal government you know alaska relies you know historically has relied heavily on that and we have a track record of doing that and we are eager to do it again when we're elected is go after every single dollar um you know to to put alaskans back to work and build up our infrastructure we're one of the youngest states in the country and you know that we we deserve a a bigger pot a a bigger piece of that pie i think because we are so young and um, our state is so large and we have such a need for that infrastructure in alaska well, I think, you know, with the situation in, in Taiwan, we talked about before and, you know, the, the melting of the, of the water and, and our strategic location with, uh, Bar- you know, Barrow and no, I mean, there's a there's obviously a very, Russia, very strategic um, purpose for Alaska. There is. And I, I, I actually I spent some time with the secretary of the Navy about the, the need for a naval base in Alaska. He explained that um, it's kind of crazy. We don't have a naval it base. It is. And, and, and I asked Coast him, Guard, said, but who, no. who's, who's got our, who's got our back? And he said, uh, well, he said, uh, you know, there's a problem. It come out of San Diego. I said, well, that's a that's not going to work. Well, the uh, Russians have you know. a huge base in Vladivostok, you know, yeah. ma- major base. Yeah, and uh, you've you spent time there, and, mm-hmm. and you understand that. And so we need to have a, a a stronger naval presence in Alaska. There's no question about it. And so we've got a number of number of options around our our, our coast to do that. And and um, so, uh, yeah, we would we would continue to push for that. I mean, what I was saying when this whole thing with with Russia happened, when they were moving the troops before the invasion. I said it would have been nice if we had a big flotilla sitting out there outside of Alaska, you know, Alaska near Russia, and we had some airplanes and some some troops. I mean, that would that would really have made the Russians nervous. But yeah. you know, we don't just didn't have that ability to do that right away, and that might have spun up some other things. But yeah. you know, having a big naval flotilla over there might <laughs> might make them think think twice. Well, you know, somebody pushed back uh, with me on that and said, well, you know, if you have a, a, a naval presence, you'll make yourself a target. I didn't really buy into that theory. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, we, yeah, we, we don't have that. Let's hide and nobody will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I'm, I'm very aggressive about having a naval presence in Alaska, of course. Uh, this hasn't come up a lot, but I, I have a feeling it will come up a lot after the primary on the Constitutional Convention. This is a 10-year, every 10 years on the ballot. There's been some folks pushing for it in the legislature. It's not become an issue yet, but I have a feeling it will be. I guess I want to ask you guys where you are on this question. And it's never passed, but it's gotten, you know, 35, 40% historically and with a lot of issues of Roe v. Wade, the dividend, how we pick judges, there's different people who have different reasons. I mean, where are you at on this on this question, and what do you what do you think will happen if it if it passes? Well, we're putting, we're not in favor of that. I know you guys are in the constitutional convention. I know you guys are. We don't have to caucus here. And, uh, <laughs> we are very opposed. No, we're, yeah. we're very opposed, and, here, and here's why. I, I mean, the last thing we need right now, there's enough uncertainty and upheaval. Uh, in our state right now, the last thing we need to do is tear up our constitution and start over again. I think that would be the worst thing we could do. So uh, there's been times we've amended it and maybe other times we need to amend it. And, and, and this, that process is, is fine. But to go and, and, and start over again with a new constitution, oh, my goodness, I can't uh, I can't even imagine. So, um, no, we're we're pretty solid. I, 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 told, I told some people uh, I was talking to Matt Chukro. He's kind of involved in the group that's uh, opposed to it. But mm-hmm. I, I said, if it goes, I'm, I'm going to run to be a delegate and they said oh my gosh that, that's a great message like, <laughs> that's a good reason for a no vote because <laughs> it's true somebody if, throw if, some ads up on that <laughs> if it passes we elect delegates and you know yeah. The, well, yeah. It, it, it is it is true it would create you know yeah. a couple of years to elect delegates and then a couple i mean it could be before the thing gets to a vote of the people it could be you know four or five years yeah which i i guess in the meantime it's it's it, it does create pretty high level of uncertainty for oh it, it does and, and it further i think divides our state into different groups and you know factions and i just think we need to bring them that's going in the wrong direction we need to bring alaskans together and not not push push them farther apart uh, i want to ask you you, you you live in anchorage uh, you live in Juneau, and it's also a problem in Juneau, homelessness and, and yeah. crimes related but but not in this but i want to f- focus on homelessness at first on uh first it, it seems in anchorage it's for, for sure gotten at least visibly worse um, we haven't been able to solve it in Anchorage. Is this a state? How much of a, this is a state issue, and how much of this you know belongs on the local level? And and, and why? And it's obviously a problem not just here, but all over the country. How do we you know solve solve these? I mean, we have a tourist destination. It's you know you drive around Anchorage, you see stuff all the time that's really not not great. 
You know, it would be easy to just say, well, this is a local issue and, and sort of, you know, push it off that way. But I, I think the state has a role in it. And, and just what I did when, when I was in office, you know, the homeless population in Juneau, we invited them to the governor's house for lunch. And someone said, why do you want to do that? I said, I want to, I want to talk to them. I want to see, I want to hear their story, their individual stories, whatnot. My security detail was extremely uncomfortable with that, uh, but that was okay. And they, you know, I said, I want the same white table claws and, and we set it up and they came in and, and I went from table to table talking to them about, you know, why, why they, uh, what, you know, what's their situation, not, not trying to make them uncomfortable, just trying to understand. And you know, what it, my takeaway from that is they, they kind of want to be left alone a little bit. They want a place that was safe and secure uh, you know, the, you know, not necessarily yeah. the situation we have now, but but I I, I think that uh, it's you know everyone has their own story about but you know about sort of why they're there where they are, and um, I think I think we need to recognize that they I mean they are uh, they're an equal part of our of our society. Uh, they need to be treated uh, that way and 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 provide a. Uh, a safe environment for them to go through whatever they're going through. I mean, we our behavioral health, you know, uh, budgets have been cut drastically. Uh, they need help in lots of different areas. What they've done in some areas is they've, they've provided a safe place for them, and then the, the resources will come to them, you know, for them to take multiple buses to get over to, you know, an appointment for this or that. And so I think there's more can be done. I think the state does have a role in it to help municipalities uh, that, that aren't able to deal with it themselves. But um, it's- Well, I mean, the, the challenge is, and we, we've, we've made a few videos on this. We've been, I spent time in the camps, like you talking, did. Yeah, talking you did. to folks. And there's a mental health element. There's a drug yeah. addiction, alcohol addiction element. There's a housing element. There's a, just a few kind of bad people who hang out around those people, a cr criminal element. And, and it just, it just um, it's just so hard that we all have to see this and, and we all want to help, but we, we just can't seem to find a way to, to, to make it better. And, and I think, in, in, at least visibly, it's, it's worse. Mm -hmm. It is, and I know, I think that what we're seeing now in Anchorage is what happens when you don't have a plan. We don't have a plan of how you're going to deal with it. I don't think what's happening now is anybody, anybody think that's a good idea. Uh, I think it's dangerous uh, out of the park in, in the out by the park yeah. and, and whatnot. Now our kids, you know, go up there, you know, playing soccer. There's a big soccer field out in that area and in, in that part of town. And so, you know, it's a matter not a matter of, of of you know pushing them one area or the other. It's a matter of making sure that there's a facility. But most important is that there are services available. They can move from that on to back to what they were doing before. Some have chosen as a, as a lifestyle, and, I, and and that was what they told me at this at this lunch and I had in in Juno. Oh, well, there's Others definitely like there's, there's an element of we want to be out here, leave us alone. That, that, yeah, there, there's, there's certainly that. But I, I think that, uh, you know, again, that's kind of what I look as our state. You know, we don't have a plan. We don't have a plan. We have ferries tied up uh, at ports because there's no crew. I mean, that's, that, that's absolutely astounding. Over a thousand teacher shortage, no, no plan. We have, we have no fiscal plan. You know, when I, you know, talked to people over the past year, the, the most common thing I heard was, we need a fiscal plan. You know, we presented one. They're not pleasant. They're not good. They have words in there politicians don't want to use. But this is what happens. We don't have a fiscal plan. Well, the work, I mean, the legislative working group came up with a plan that was, I mean, obviously, it's even funny if you go back to, I think, in 99 or 2000, there was a fiscal policy caucus. And I actually got a copy of, somebody gave me a copy of the, of the, of the work product from that. And it's basically the same thing. I mean, nothing mm -hmm. changes. There's, there's well, because three or four get, kind of main elements. That, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't get passed. We put out a, a buffet of, of options, and, and then there was too many options, so we packed it together, and then there weren't enough options. But there's a role for the governor and lieutenant governor in that. Absolutely a role. That's the lead, that's when leadership. It's tough leadership. You know, when you when you stand up and say we need to do this, need to do that, need to make these adjustments. But you know, <laughs> it's political courage that made this state. And it's be political courage is going to get us out of the situation we're in right now. And so deferring, you know, I, I heard uh, Governor Dunleavy on on talk of Alaska uh, a year or so ago, and in and, and Lori Townsend said, "What is your fiscal plan?" He said, "Well, here's my fiscal plan." He said, "I'm going to call the legislature in for uh, multiple special sessions to give them more time amongst themselves to discuss and come up with a plan." That's not the role of the governor. The governor is to be out there and and work with them, but present a plan. If they don't like it, that's fine. But work for something. You got to put something on the table. And so, waiting for the legislature to come up with a fiscal plan is is, is like waiting at a bus stop for a train to come by. That's not their job. And even with the the working group, they came up with a, a document. But that's part. Of, I mean, that's eight people on the group, and then it's a matter of getting it passed. And and the governor didn't didn't weigh in much. I mean, he, he did support the fifty fifty for a year. But then when the price of oil went up, he went. You know, at some point, it was the Senate passed five thousand five hundred and. It just it just totally went the whole year of 50 50 
where I think most people were in agreement, that just went out the door as soon as the price of oil. Jeff, Jeff, we've gone through $20 billion of savings in the last 10 years, $20 billion. No combination of states have $20 billion of savings. We had a $20 billion of savings that had gone through because we couldn't come up with a fiscal plan. So I, you know, coming up with a 50-50 plan, that solves, solves one, one, one slice of it. What, what's, what's the balance? So continuing to drain that savings account, you know, that's, um, uh, that's what drove us crazy as far as we wanted a fiscal plan. We were willing to, you know, say those words that, that others would not say. And the number of legislators that supported, I was very, I was very pleased with. Some came to me and said, Governor, we absolutely agree with your plan. It is a great plan. And I said, great, I need your vote. Get out and of they say, well, I won't vote for and it. And they right? said, well, I can't vote for it. And I said, well, why can't you vote for it? And she said, well, I can't because my constituents don't understand. I said, okay, tell me what you've done and I'll, I'll come alongside and I'll, I'll <clears throat> augment what you've done with your constituents. She said, well, I've done nothing. I said, well, why have you done nothing? She said, I won't use those words you use. I would never get reelected. And I said, this meeting's over. It's clearly you don't work for your constituents. You work for you, and if your focus is getting reelected. Then I, we have nothing to talk about. So that's that's it's a sad commentary on some, not all. There's some great legislators, but when they start making decisions based upon their own reelection, they're working for themselves. Well, I think we. I mean, anybody who's involved, you see it. You talk to people privately, and the the many of them will speak pretty frankly if they are comfortable with you. But then they go and do 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 the opposite. Um, not everybody, you're right, but there's a, there, go, go ahead, Heidi, you were going to say something. Well, <clears throat> oftentimes, uh, Governor says, uh, Bill Walker says, you know, there's politics for purpose and politics for power. And, you know, we are in, we are in the business of politics for purpose. Uh, we are both born and raised in this state. We love this state, um, you know, educated through the public school system in this state. Um, both of us have raised our families here. I'm raising my four and a half year old daughter. And I, I want her to have the same opportunities that I had growing up here. You know, the fact that I'm sitting here, the daughter of a firefighter and a pioneer home cook running for Lieutenant Governor is a testament to the excellent education that I received and the support that I received um, from my teachers and from my community. I'm a graduate of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. We, we feel like we have, uh, we owe it to Alaska to, to give back what Alaska has already given to us. So we really feel a sense of purpose to get Alaska back on track. And right now we have a governor who is in the business of politics for power. And you can see it every time he slams the current president or he, uh, you know, touts the national party line. We never used to have that in Alaska politics. We We were sort of um, unique that way that, you know, in, in Alaska, politics is different. We work with each other. You know, you can be a Republican or a Democrat, but we work together. We find common ground. Um, it's not always perfect, but, um, you know, there was that, that sense that, you know, and we talk about it often, you know, Senator Ted Stevens would say to hell with politics, just do what's right for Alaska. And when you do that, things become a lot more clear. Um, but that's only if you're in the business of politics for purpose and not politics for power. Uh, last thing I want to ask is if, if you prevail and you and you and you're the governor, lieutenant governor, what, what do you see? Bill, I'll start with you. The 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 most crucial or the, the biggest issue, you know, facing Alaska in the next four years. What's the what's the fo what's going to be the big focus? Well, the, f the first thing we want to do is we want to resolve the permanent fund dividend issue. We want to make sure that it's sustainable, that it's fair, that, it, that people can anticipate it. We need we need to take that off the table in, in a way that Alaskans are comfortable with it and secure in it, that they know that it's not going to be changed with another administration or another administration. So that, that's the first thing that we need to do. We have got to address the, our cost of energy uh, across the state. And in some villages, it's $17 a gallon for, for fuel. So we've got to we've, we've got to address that. You know, we, we've got to get back uh, the, the trust that's been lost in the state. We have we have we need to build about that that relationship and, and and with the legislature as well and because it is it is a, a team sport so that i mean our education issues as far as the uh uh you know there are, are plans that we have as far as how do we grow the educational pool as far as the the, the loss of teachers and um and make sure that they have a, you know benefits and those kinds of things that are that are appropriate you know alaska is number one in opioid uh, deaths in in the nation we have risen to number one we need to address that again like we did before declaration of disaster and and aggressively go after that and go after the drugs that are coming into alaska i'm a big fan of drug dogs and fa big fan of interception 
and 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 we we can do do more in that There's area. This report that came out, I think the overdose deaths are up thirty five or more percent from the previous year. And yeah, it's it's, it's, it's is, really it is really it, high. It's a crisis. It's a disaster. And I would ne I was never hesitant in in issuing a declaration. When Alaskans die, it's a disaster. And 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 we issued we're one of the first states issued a declaration of disaster in the opioid crisis. President Trump invited myself, Governor Baker, Governor Hogan to to uh, the signing when he issued a declaration of disaster in the opioid crisis in, at the White House because we had done it as as governors. So I would never be hesitant to issue a declaration of disaster, and I do that because it, it highlights the situation. You can do things uh, that you can't do otherwise. Uh, you can you can get you know federal assistance otherwise. You know the other thing, Jeff, is the it, it's it's the economy. I mean, our economy is is uh, is floundering. You know, there's so much uncertainty out there. So we are the we are at the bottom. I think we're ahead of Mississippi, maybe uh, in in 49 or 50th in, in the nation as far as at the bottom of uh, recovery of our economy post COVID. So it's it's a matter of, of of prioritizing that and and being bold and not being afraid about you know like like Heidi says it's you know when you don't have a you know a party line you're worried about crossing. It's just it's just the boundaries of Alaska. And so that's a great way to govern. It's a great way to make decisions. And you get a lot more done by by focusing on what's best for Alaska and take the whole partisanship out of it. We have no issues with any parties at all, but we just don't feel that's the best the best method. You know, we had one president of the United States that was that was an independent. Oh, who was that? I, I feel like I should know this. George Washington. And what he said was he said, I can't join a party. He said, I want to be the president of the United States. I don't want to be the president of a party. That's, yeah, so, that's, that's wow. So, wow. So that's, there was a couple, I think there was a few wigs and some different different ones. But yeah, you're, you're that's, wow, that's interesting. That's a good point. So, and, and he was the one who only did two terms. Yeah. He, we didn't re repeal that until after Roosevelt. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's um, uh, so anyway, that I mean, it, it is a great way to govern because you just, as Heidi said, you just laser focus on what's best for Alaska. And, and there are no political spins, there's no polling and, you know, checking with the party bosses, no one whispering in your ear about, you know, hey, you know, the party won't like this, you know, uh -huh. so. Heidi, I'll, I'll go to you, uh, you know, biggest issue or next four I mean, years. There's a lot, I, I, you know, this is the greatest state in the country. This, this is most beautiful um, it's, we are so fortunate to have the permanent fund, um, this endowment that is the envy of the world. Um, that is our, that is our, that's our, our, our golden goose. Um, we need to grow the permanent fund. When we grow the permanent fund to a hundred, 120 billion, Alaska set, we can live off the earnings of that permanent fund to fund government and, you know, education, have high quality education, uh, and our university system, our ferry system. We can have these things, but we need to be fiscally responsible when we do it. We also need, I, I wanna see an Alaska that is thriving again. Um, we need to make Alaska more affordable. We need affordable energy. As, as Bill said, we need affordable housing. We need affordable childcare. These are some of the, the obstacles that young families are facing and young Alaskans are facing when they want to, you know, some of them who want to stay here and have jobs here and thrive here. And I, I've talked to so many young Alaskans lately. Um, you know, I'm starting to, to age out of that at 44, but I've got a few a friends who are in the twenties and thirties. It's hard to live. I ask every one of them, I'm super nosy. Like what's, what's, what's the cost of your rent? What's, what's your, what's your mortgage payment? It's I, expensive I, to I, live in Alaska. We need to address some of these issues so that this is a state that we can all afford to live in and to thrive in. I've said for you know, a long time now with this inflation, it's even worse, but family of four that's even making, you know, a hundred grand. I mean, think about it, going to the movies and dinner, what it costs. I mean, it's yeah. $300, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's it, people used to be- I don't able, know what movie you're seeing. That's a little expensive, but- I mean, $20 for a ticket, food- Going and, out to Sullivan. You know, I'm, no, I'm talking, <laughs> but if you go to dinner, it's gonna be a hundred, a hundred bucks, hundred fifty yeah. bucks. It's, yeah. it's, it's really, even people who make, yeah. you know, what we think is okay money, it's, it's really hard for, yeah. for, you know, two parent, you know, family of four with two parents, even when they're both working, it's, it's, you know, some people on the top ends of the income are doing very well, but, but even now with this inflation, I mean, the cost of goods are going up 10, 15, 20%, wages might be going up a few percent. And it's, it's a, it's a really big concern, even before this inflation problem started mm -hmm. with, right. with, with the ability to work and, and take care of yourself, have a, have a house go on, We all want to go on a vacation once in a while. And it's gotten worse. It's, 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 we've um, got to address it. Yeah, as we head into winter, I you know I've 
Uh, we were in Bethel the other day and uh, met with a number of people, a lot of people, and they're concerned about um, their relatives on the Yukon River as far as, you know, no fish for the second year in a row. What's the plan for that? You know, I mean, they're just, there's so many things that they're in turmoil right now. I mean, I, I, I honestly feel, as I look around the state, and I'm not just saying this because I'm running for governor, I feel like we're imploding. I mean, I think we're quietly imploding as far as, you know, education, marine highway system, you know, cost of energy, uh, you know, lack of fish in some areas, great fish in, in, uh, in Bristol Bay. But there are just, there's a lot of things out there that, that, uh, um, that we're not doing what we used to do uh, because we're not, we're focused on, you know, uh, we don't have a vision. We don't have a vision and we don't have the political courage to, to, to go after that vision. And, 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 and a vision isn't re-election. That's not what you, what you focus on. As, as Commissioner uh, Hoffbeck, Randy Hoffbeck, when he, uh, I asked him to, uh, to come on as, as Commissioner of Revenue, he was retiring from North Slope Borough, and, and he asked me a question. He said, I want to know, well, during this term, are we going to be uh, do, doing the job or are we going to be working to keep the job? And I said, we're going to do the oh. job. He said, okay, under those terms, I'll work, I'll work for you. And that's what we did. So that's what we're about. We're, we're, we're you know, we're not, we're not, uh, you know, yes, I have served before. Uh, I don't know if that makes me a career politician or not, but uh, I have you're, learned. You were mayor of Valdez, right? I was mayor of Valdez. That's a long time. But I've discovered that my, my love for Alaska exceeds my uh, discomfort with politics. I, I, I absolutely love the state and with the four children and six grandchildren we have, you know, uh, shame on me if I did not step in the arena uh, when the polls showed that I was the most likely to be able to beat the incumbent. Um, how do you walk away from that? Well, Bill, I want to thank you, Bill Walker and Heidi Dragas, for, for um, coming for the interview. It's about two weeks till the primary. The early voting is open. The absentee applications, I think you have until August 6th. So it's, it's going to be a busy, busy few weeks up until August 16th. And then after that, I think it's really going to go into kind of high gear for the this ranked choice general. And uh, I, I think it'll be you, Dunleavy, Gara, and then it's going to be the Kirker Pierce situation. We'll see how that plays out for the uh, for the next few months after the primary. Well, Jeff, thanks very much, and thanks for what you do and helping Alaskans hear from all candidates. Thank you. You're 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 nonpartisan when it comes to that, and and I'm uh, registered nonpartisan. You, you know, well, good, good. Uh, so this is a caucus meeting. Sorry. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for what you do well, and, you. And, the, and the way you do it, and you keep people informed across the state and those that can't travel to Juno to. Uh, uh, to know what's going on. They're, they're lucky. They're, well, they're, they're, they're missing out because <laughs> Juno's a wonderful place. But <laughs> Juno's a wonderful place. It, it, I love it. I should qualify, Juneau. you know, to spend three or four months in Juno for the session. I can, it, whew, it's, <laughs> Oh, it's a great it's, community. It's, it's, a, it's a place. It's a, it, the, the, the capital is its own thing. That's it's true. its own thing. That's, it is. Yeah. It is. We, we thoroughly enjoyed uh, living in Juno and look forward to it again if that's the way it works out. And, and uh, But anyway, thank you for the, having us on and thanks for what you yep. do in general for the public. Best luck in the primary and we'll, we'll be uh, hopefully doing some debates and we'll be seeing you guys again after the after the primary. So again, folks, I want to thank you for watching. We're going to be doing interviews with all of the uh, main candidates for governor um, on the landmine here and then we'll be doing some debates afterwards for, for, the, uh, for the general election. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for more of our interviews. And again, I want to thank Bill Walker and Heidi Dragas for for being here. Thanks.